And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming coming to us from the land of Flo coming to us to a, from the land of Florida men. <laughs> and <laughs> and a man and a man who probably who probably gets way too many remember the Alamo jokes. The and cre and of course creator of the E Z R P G, spelled with a Z. And a Y and a Y, of course, because you gotta have that. Why? Because it is that way. The one and only <laughs> Ryan Alamo. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Um, as far as the floor, as far as bringing up Florida, man. Um, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> oh, it's totally chill. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for the for the jokes. I've I put up with a lifetime of how to talk Minnesotan jokes, so. I hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are cremated equal. <laughs> so, I'd like to start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, so it started for me in high school. My friends and I, um, we all liked board games. I'd have people over board games. And everyone so often, someone mentioned, oh, what about, like, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, role-playing games? I was like, that's too much. Like, we can't go there. You know, no hard drugs. Just the soft stuff like a ton. Um, but then one of our friends went ahead and just bought uh, one of the guides, the, the player's handbook. And, dude, like, just reading that, like, looked to me. Um, we would, like, pass it around, like, some sort of... Um, like banned book and like classes from like person to person because we learn on coffee. Um, we all get into it, planned our characters, and then just on Friday nights instead of board games, we started doing D and D, and it was just a ton of fun. Mm -hmm. Um, if I had if if I had to put a bit of a guess onto which onto which version, um. I'm thinking it was either AD and D or third edition. Actually, we were super basic. It was fifth edition. <laughs> yeah, and I'm get I'm guess how long how long did it take before before the realization set in that you had become the forever DM? Oh man, um, I think it hit me in like college, where um, every time we'd go back to high school, like every time we'd like all meet up back at home. Um, I would always be the one that had to plan the adventure. And I think by my sophomore year, I'm like, oh, okay, this is my role now. Mm -hmm. And I'm so I'm certainly no I'm certainly no stranger to to be to being that. In my case, it's because everybody else chickened out. <laughs> Like, sure, I'll be the D I'll be the DM up until up until the last moment they're like, Yeah, maybe maybe it's best that you do it, you know more than me. Ah, that one. Um Of course of course I think the I think the other reason is um is that is everybody else was afraid that I was gonna have them I was gonna have them go through the punishment gain of drink of drinking the pain glass. Oh, what's the pain glass? I'm intrigued. Um can you it's a you have two options. Option 1 is a bottle of bacon soda. <laughs> Option 2 is a shot glass filled with um fi with five different kinds of hot sauce, some some salt, some sea salt, some pepper, some black pepper, and ground up jalapeno seeds. Oh man, that is horrifying. Well, if I'm going to call something the pain glass, I got to deliver. I guess you do. Oh, man, dude, for me, like, spicy Cheetos are spicy. I think that second one would kill my character off in the real world. So, ne so never get, never give you the, that black chip. <laughs> yeah, no, please, I want to live. I'll choose number one. I, I can probably handle a baking side. 
<laughs> um, I'm not sure if you sh I'm not sure if you should be so confident on that. It tastes like if you combine a club soda with bacon grease. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> that's a painful choice for sure. Well, that that's the whole point. It is meant it is meant to be a it is it is meant to be a no win situation. You have two choices. One choice leads to pain. <laughs> But were you throughout the years? Were you were you mainly a a um D, a D and D guy, or did you experiment with other systems? Honestly, I was mostly a D and D guy. Um, I had a friend or two exposed me to a few others, but um, those were kind of just one shots. They never really stuck. Like my core friend group knew and played D and D. Mm -hmm. uh, given that it's a it's quite it it is always gonna be quite the leap to to dec to decide to um and to decide to enter into the wild and wacky world of des of designing your own game so how did that how did that come to be yeah so what happened is that in college I kept in high school you know we could have long campaigns pretty easily. Um, in college, that wasn't really possible. People were busy. Um, everything's a little more transitory there, right? So you'll plan out this whole campaign. Um, you'll send, spend like everyone will spend, you'll spend like four hours in like a session zero with everyone building the characters, and then you have an adventure or two, and then suddenly finals pops up or midterms or something. The game kind of dies, and I was getting really frustrated by how much or very little limited time was getting. Um, spent in prep. So how this whole thing started actually is I literally just went onto like Microsoft Word and typed up some um, cards for character powers mm -hmm. and started using that for um, and started using that for character creation instead of um, like the Game Master's Guide. I'd imagine you had plenty of fun when it came to doing this for spells. Oh, well... Just D&D &D spells. So it'd be like, oh, this will give you like a few cleric spells. So you didn't, you didn't try and write out the full rules of any individual spells? Not when we started. Not when I started it, no. Which is understandable because while well, some spells you could probably write down on a, on a business card, there are those where you could only if you're using a t a text size that's so small. I need an electron microscope in order to read it. <laughs> Especially a good yeah, and if you got a printer to print it. <laughs> I'm pretty I'm pretty sure the ink required would make it look like just a would just black, <laughs> or that you were well, maybe if something it's... in Morse code or something. Yeah, so we could have the spells in Morse code. That's how we could do it. Oh, I'd be lying if I said I didn't. I didn't do that once, and I've told the story in the past about how I how I trolled my English teacher because I submitted a um, I submitted a large um, pa large paper assignment that I had to write in um, mirror writing. The thing mirror was, writing? Yeah, mirror writing. I.e., in order to read it, you have to hold it up to a mirror because it's upside down and backwards. <laughs> <coughs> Damn, that's quite the troll. It was 20 pages long, double-sided. Oh my gosh. And when I was asked why I did it, I had simply I had simply said, why did you set a due date for April 1st? You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that is the best April Fool's prank I've heard in a while. That is awesome. I've had a I've had a lot of those to the point where I've gotten the nickname of the prankster prince. That is, oh, that is cool. That is quite the title. Well, it's not like it's not like I'm doing anything unique per se. It's just it's just that there are some the things that people would think are t are too crazy to do, I ended up doing. You're like no no no. It's not crazy enough. Well, everybody does. The, everybody has the whole thing with the hand in warm water or the shaving cream. 
I'm the kind of person who would who would spend a lot of who would spend a lot of money to have signs that say "Free T-shirts turn right" and put them on, and strategically place them to make people drive in circles. <laughs> oh. oh, that is not one I've heard of before. <laughs> oh, I am the person who, in order to keep people from midnight snacking in the kitchen, would would rig the kitchen floor with with pounds of D4s. So you just make real life an RPG, like your own life. Um, I'd be lying if I said that in both both in our both in my DMing style and in and in my um and in real life. I took wait I I got way too many ideas from the media I consumed, which a fair bit of it was stuff like Home Alone and <laughs> and um Tom and Jerry. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so, <laughs> so, I, so there. I think that's the reason why, in my early days, I was insistent on playing a rogue who was whose main gimmick was was built was building traps. Oh, so traps was your main that? Okay, I can see that. Yeah. Oh. The signature being being rune traps like the up button, as as it was called. Oh, you just send them up to the sky. No, you you step on the thing, you go straight up. As if you as if you cast fly on yourself. Ah. Uh... Um. We had an incident where a, where a dragon ended up step ended up stepping on the thing, and there's no weight limit on that on this trap. Not only that, but the but this but the area that he was in was full was full of adamantite. That stuff's not budging. So when he ended up hitting the ceiling, and he still had a few se he still had five seconds to go. Um, you ever see a compactor? <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine one. Yeah, like a, like a compactor when they crush cars. That's what happened to the dragon. Oh my gosh, that is epic and horrifying, and yeah, that is a D and D prank. Oh, uh, now the my when it comes to doing when it comes to doing pranks in D in D and D in D and D, I would do I would do I would do sim I would do simple things, um, like like turn like um. Like having like having elaborate puzzles that are that are all one giant setup for a for a very bad dad joke. <laughs> when I say elaborate, I'm talking. It takes the party hours to figure it out, and then they realize that it was just that it was just one giant troll job. No! Oh my gosh! I'd be screaming. Oh. Um. I did. I did at one. I did at one point for a for a piracy themed campaign. Use the whole thing of. Uh, use the get use the gag of in, tr in Trinidad in Trinidad a pi in Trinidad a pie co a pie costs a, bu a buck fifty, in in Jamaica it co it costs two twenty five. These are the pie rates of the Caribbean. <laughs> That took me a sec. All right, I see. Yeah, but what one of the things that I noticed when it came to the ability scores, getting getting more on things, is mm -hmm. there's only five instead of the usual six. What made you drop Constitution? Yeah. So what happened is I realized, um, you know, I had the rule set increase, like Constitution increases your health, um, and it like determines your starting health and all that. And then I realized. Um, one, a lot of the, a lot of people I play tested with never touched a role playing game before, had heard of D and D and were kind of interested, but never played like a role playing game. They didn't understand the importance of constitution. They didn't really understand what the word meant. They would drop it and they'd have super weak characters. And secondly, constitution wasn't serving much purpose for me, except for as a mapping to health. So instead of that. Um, as you level, you start with a base health based on your class, 
And as you level up, instead of increasing one of the ability scores, you can just directly increase your health. So it kind of removed a layer of complexity and seemed to make it the game kinder to new players. Mm -hmm. Now, when it came to... One thing that I, that I will always find interesting when I see it in games is the utilization of uh, of cards as a uh, either as a reference or as or as some or as something else mm -hmm. and in this particular in this particular case you you talk you the way you describe the the um a, a character is that you'd have an ancestry card a cl a class card and a mm -hmm. wep and a weapon and armor card. Um. Now, one thing that one thing that I'm curious about is, I do see the star thing. Is it a case where you on do you only have three levels, or does every class have three uh, have three abilities out of the gate? Um. So first off, um, there's not like a weapon and an armor card. Well, I guess there. That's more of a reference. Mm -hmm. So, like, all the weapons and armors are listed on the card. And then all you just right. write it down in a character sheet. Um, but how it works is every card has, like, three stars. So every card has three levels. When you get a new card, so when you pick up your first class and ancestry card, you start with the first level, the first star. And then when you level up, you can either upgrade one of your existing cards, getting that second level, or if you're right at your second level, getting that third level, or you can grab a new specialty card, which is like a variation on classes, but designed to be like picked up on a higher level later on. Mm -hmm. Now, given given that, I'm guess I'm guessing that this isn't a case where, like in. In a game like D and D, because of the fact that you have twenty levels to contend with, um, you're not able to have as many to have as many um, base classes in, in the book. You've only got around th you've only got around thirteen. Um, yeah. Putting as putting aside subclasses and all that, which is just an extension of the class, so I don't count it. Uh, I know some people might say you're, uh, that that fighter subclasses are supposed to be called martial archetypes. I'm like, no. It walks like a duck and talks like a duck. It sure as hell ain't a goose. <laughs> I'll agree with you on that one, yeah. But I'm guessing, I'm guessing that if you were to do a count of the number of classes that you have, both not not counting specialties, you have more. I have twenty. And I'm get, and um, I'm guessing that he, I'm guessing that a lot of them recommend. Recommend a a um, high ability score for starters, and and the other thing I'm curious about is if the classes maintain the color scheme for ability scores. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, most all, almost all the classes, um, except for a few more complicated ones, recommend one civic ability score. So, like a gladiator recommends strength. Um, a magician recommends intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, the the color coding for the ability scores um, isn't that big a thing. It's kind of just there on the character sheet. The all the class cards are blue, and all the ancestry cards are red, and all the specialty cards are yellow, mm -hmm. pretty much. Now. When it comes to, since you mentioned gladiator, I'm guessing that one of the classes that you have is fighter. What would be the difference between a gladiator and a fighter in that instance, or your equivalent to a fighter? Yeah, so um, a gladiator, um, their whole thing is that they benefit from having other fighters nearby. Um, other fighters can use a bonus action to give the gladiator um, help equivalent like to give them advantage on their attack rolls and then the highest levels uh, the gladiator gives advantage back so now if you've got two fighters a gladiator and somebody else um, they're giving each other advantage by working together and being in close proximity uh, the toxin is another class that's very similar to a fighter 
its whole stick is that it's a tank class. So the longer it fights, um, it's lowering the enemy's uh, attacks because theoretically there's um, like toxins in the air, like poisoning them. Mm-hmm. But then they poison their weapons. So once you land one attack, uh, now the enemy's taking damage over time. So their whole theme is to just do a little damage and then just stick there and stick it out. Yep. Now, because it's me and because I have to maintain my shtick, do you have a monk? I'm a, I have a muscle man who only punches and wrestles. And, and you can make him strength or agility. So you can have Bruce Lee or Arnold, Sch- or Arnold Schwarzenegger. When you said muscle man, I immediately thought of of, ha- of Hans and Franz from that old SNL sketch. <laughs> <laughs> That's not far off the marsh. I don't know why my brain goes into goes into those directions. It just does. Oh, who knows what our brains are doing. Well, hopefully us. I mean, it's our brains. Hopefully. But when it comes... I'm guess I'm guessing that... Th- that, um... There's... That there isn't as much of a MAD issue with builds. Uh, MAD, if you don't know, is short for Multiple Ability Dependency. A, a if you're dependent on like your strength and your wisdom that um, you're a weaker character it's usually mo- most classes are going to be dependent on two abilities maybe sometimes sometimes just one a fighter all a fighter is really going to need is good strength and good con good strength for so that they can so that they can hit hard and Good cons so that they can get hit and still and still be kicking. Mm-hmm. A character with multiple ability dependency is one whose kit prefers that they have a high ability score in at least three abilities. The monk in third the monk in third edition is the poster child for this. Oh. And I'd I'd even okay. go I'd even go so far as to say the the um that the that even the monk in fifth that um the monk in fifth in fifth edition or even the ranger could be it could be examples of this issue um because with something like the monk you need you're gonna need strength you're gonna need con because you're a frontliner mm-hmm. even if, even if you're even if you're a bit more hit and run than say a fighter you're still gonna be focused on doing melee damage. Oh, and you're going to need wisdom so you can properly utilize key. I see now. Oh. Yeah, so so yeah, Easy RPG doesn't really suffer from that. Um every character basically has like a primary ability score hmm. and then like a secondary one. That's how most of the characters are designed. And then if not, then they just have the one. Yeah. But I'm get I'm guessing the ones that have primary and secondary are in the minority or their specializations. Yeah, I guess you could look at it like that. Yeah, like a primary score and then sort of like a secondary one. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the specialty cards, I'm guessing that is your equivalent to subclasses or prestige classes. Yeah, yeah, it's a way. Yeah, it's it's how you level up your character um, mm-hmm. abilities. Yeah, and in in that it is the requirements are are a lot of these specialty requirements um, be just based on le- just based on level or some of them specifically tied to certain classes. So actually, no, um, there are like the specialty cards don't have any requirements. And the way that's balanced is with that, like, three-power system. Mm-hmm. Um, so if there's a really strong power, it'll be locked behind the third star. 
And the first and the second powers, you know, may not be as strong. So you really have to, like, invest three level ups to get that strong power boost. Mm -hmm. um, so the specialties are really free. Um, any character can grab one. And it's all kind of about, like, whatever niche you want to involve in, evolve into. Mm -hmm. Now, I did see that you have a... That you have a that you have a monster maker um, on your on your website. And yeah. If I'm I'm guessing I'm guessing that the way that um the way that you're having it set up instead of using instead of using CR something that I have issues with but that's another story. Are you go Are you going with a broad tier approach instead? Yeah, yeah, I call them power levels. Um, there's five of them, and basically, when you're on this monster maker, you select your power level, and that will give you a sort of range for your like stats and attack. Mm -hmm. um, what power levels so, are there? And what, and what would be a... I'd like you to go through the power levels and what would be a, a, monster, you're a monster from, say, the monster manual that would be relatively in that area. Sorry, cut off there. I can't hear you. Oh. What, okay, I can hear you again. Yeah, what would be? What would be a exact? What would, for each? I'd like you to go through the power levels from lowest to highest, and what would be a example monster you can you can think of that would be roughly equivalent? Yeah. So, the lowest level is minion. So that's like your goblin, um, your kobold. Um, it's something that like a level one character can like take on. Um, and like, so if you had five level one characters, you could have five minions, and that's pretty much a balanced encounter. Mm -hmm. Then you've got standard. So this is like an orc. Um, this creature is like a challenge for like a like a, a level three player, like a, a group, like. Um, one level three player versus one standard monster is like a balance encounter. Mm -hmm. um, after that, you've got elite, which is like an orc chieftain. Um, maybe he's got a few spell. Maybe he's got like a special attack. Maybe he takes an extra action. Um, got something up his sleeve, you know, and he's got like extra health and all that. Then you've got your boss. So this is like a young dragon. Um, Maybe a giant. Um, and then you've got your mega boss, which is like a high level adventuring party fights a mega boss, and that's like the big bad for the encounter. You know, like an ancient dragon, a lich, something of that scale. Also known as also known as something that would be a boss in an SNK fighter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, I'm not. No, I'm totally not salty about about all the all the time all the time I spent getting my ass kicked by geese. Totally not salty. <laughs> it's part of the game, right? <laughs> it is, but it's it's one of the, but um, at the very at the very least, I don't have to suffer it alone. Everybody, that's true. Everybody else has shared the pain, and hell, S and well, SNK boss syndrome is a term for a reason. <laughs> but with that, with that, with that kind of thing in mind, uh, when I looked at the whole attack dice setup, I'm guess would it be fair of me to say would it be fair of me to say that the default role four characters is not is not going to be straight d20 plus modifiers you have a you have a you'd be correct to say that d20s are really just used for social encounters mm -hmm. um in combat typically um you're going to be rolling um 2d4s if you're an agility character um you're going to be rolling a d12 if you're a strength character um and if you're a magic character honestly you can be rolling all sorts of die So, I'm. 
is it a, how would how would that kind of thing be how would that kind of thing be generated? Is it based on the is it based on the strength score that's going to determine what die you roll? Oh, um, so it's based on the weapon you choose, mm -hmm. um, and then it's based on like the spell you're using. But so every spell has its own set of dice. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna I was gonna ask on that because um, on the Kickstarter page there isn't a example of a caster character. So I didn't know, oh, I didn't yeah. know if you had if you had a different setup because the class example that's given is the assassin, and obviously assassins aren't casters. Ah, uh, yeah, I see. Yeah, no, there's spellcaster characters, um, and there's a spell book out there mm -hmm. um, that you can check out. Now, when it comes to when it comes to spells. Are you operating on the Vancian model or not? I'm not familiar with that, with that actually. Um, the Vancian model is the name given to the spell char to the spell charge system that's been used throughout D and D over the years. Uh, the whole spells per day thing is what it is. Oh uh, yes, I do use that system. Um, if you have a minor spell, it's essentially a cantrip. You can use unlimited times. Um, any other spell you get to use once, um, then you're done until you rest. Mm -hmm. And are you still? Are you doing the whole? Th is are you? Do you have a specific amount of time that counts as a rest, or do you, or do you treat it as a kind of um, GM's call? I treat it as a GM's call, but the things I do have said in stone is that you get uh, one break, so like a short rest. Um, and this is the kind of thing that, like, you could use in, like, a clear dungeon room. Mm -hmm. Like, it's supposed to be, like, a break, maybe in hostile territory. And then your rest, which recovers every... And you can only do a break once mm -hmm. um, until you rest. And then a rest, you have to do it in non-hostile territory. And if you get ambushed when you rest, then you don't have your armor on. So you got to be careful where you rest. Well, I'm pretty sure people who've played Kingmaker will be right at home with that. But when it comes to when I come, and I'm get I'm guessing I'm guessing each of I'm guessing that when it comes to a lot of the abilities there isn't that distinguish from there isn't that distinct there isn't that distinguish between short rest and long rest when it comes to abilities it's just you can't use this again until you do a rest. Uh, no, there actually is a lot of distinguishment. Ah. Um, so if I have an ability that um, I want people to like use more often, mm -hmm. um, then I'll give it to them as a break because players um, are more prone to like use that in combat when they know they can break and get it back. And then if I'm like, no, this is your signature ability, you're going to use it once, and you're going to use it carefully... Um, or you're going to use it twice, but you're going to use it carefully, then I'm going to make it recover only with the rest. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, the Magician has, or no, the, the Time Weaver uh, manip manipulates time, has um, a power where he turns an action into a bonus action, and I want him to be using this to support his allies uh, fairly often. Mm -hmm. So he gets... Three for every break. Yeah. Um, the Dead Eye, who's like our ranged sniper character, has a once per rest ability where he just totally ignores um, enemy armor, and that's meant to be like a precise shot to like take down a big bad. Mm -hmm. So it's once per rest. They know they only got one, and they have to they 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 try to plan it really carefully. Yeah. Now, are you you are you are you um, are you going with a grid-based approach when it comes to bat when it comes to combat, or are you going more theater of the mind with how it's set up? Uh, grid-based. That's the vision for it. Mm -hmm. And one th one thing that I one thing that I saw when I lo when I looked through these spells is the time entry. Um, how 
And ju just with it listed as A, although I th actually, actually, I th is it a is it a case of it's either a, it's either a specific amount of minutes or it's auto or it just goes right off when you declare it? Are you broke up a bit there? <laughs> um, I was curious about the A when it came to time on the spells. Oh, that's short for action. Oh. And then BAOD bonus action, RB reaction, mm -hmm. um, and if anything else is designed to be like out of combat. Yeah. And I'm guessing the di I'm guessing the dice is the dice that you're rolling for the for the spell casting or sp or spell casting automatic. Uh, the first one. It's what you're rolling for the spell casting. Mm -hmm. If there's no dice, then it is automatic. So would it, if you're so, for instance, for emulate, since that has it that you're rolling a d12 versus a d6, are you you're rolling that and comparing that against rolling that at adding intelligence and comparing that to the dex roll in that case? Oh, uh, so what you do is you compare it to the target stats. You're comparing it to the enemy's dex. Um, although it's actually a typo, it should be agility. Um, and the idea is that um, you're going to take whatever you rolled for your spell, you're going to add your bonus to it, so it might be your in for an in spell, um, whiz for a wisdom spell, and then you're going to whatever stat that's challenging, so in this case agility, um, agility, you're going to take what you rolled for the spell, and you're going to subtract three times your enemy's agility, and that's how much damage you deal. Mm -hmm. So the basic premise is that you have to choose your spell for your enemy. You know, if it's a slippery little um, goblin, you go, okay, low strength, let me hit him with a strength spell, if I'm an orc, and maybe I hit him with an intelligence or a wisdom spell. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes... Now, given, the given that, I'm guessing that... Is is it a case where um, if you pick if you pick a spellcasting class, then you that you'd get a would you get a set number of 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 spells, or would it be, or would the spells that you get be specific to the class? They're specific to the class, um, and then if as you get your specialty cards, um, you continue down like spells of that same ability score. Mm -hmm. um, then you tend to get spells that target the same abilities. So intelligence spells um, tend to target um, agility and intelligence, actually. Mm -hmm. Into maybe charisma spells, um, then you'd be targeting strength and wisdom. So by branching out different spells, your bonus won't be as high because your stats are spread out, but you can target your enemy's weakness better. Mm -hmm. Now, what do, now? Um, in obvious, obviously, in something like in something like the D twenty system, you have it where criticals are are on a natural twenty. Do you have a critical system that you're working with? Yes. So. If in combat you roll a die, um, let's say it's a d12, mm -hmm. and you roll the maximum value, so you roll a 12, uh, then you get to re-roll that die once. Oh, ex exploding dice. Exactly. Oh. Um. Would there be would there be any potential effects that could expand it? Some some equivalent of expanded critical. Yeah, actually. So, for example, the human. Um, their ancestry ability is that ones are critical. So you roll a one on d12, that suddenly counts as a 12 instead, mm -hmm. and you get to re-roll it. Yeah. Does it, in that particular case, would it still count as a one in, ter in terms of the math, or would it just be treated as if you rolled a 12? It would. It would be treated as a 12 in terms of the math too. Yeah. Now, I know. Th I know that. One of the one of the means you've used to um, to pit, to pitch this is the cards, but 
I'm curious if you've, ha because of the card-based design, if you've had any plans to put to put some version of this on, like tabletop simulator or tabletopia, yeah, some sort of virtual tabletop like that. But that's not the focus right now. Mm -hmm. Um. I guess, like, after this Kickstarter, my focus is for near expansion are um, to develop things like the Monster Maker to, like, continue to make it easier for, like, game masters to make new material mm -hmm. and to, like, share them and copy them and all that. I gotcha. Now, if... Because of, because of the card design, one particular idea I could see somebody coming up with is, is, um, all, is an all-random party. <laughs> i.e. i.e. set i.e. set e set each um set each i set set the character not the character the um the ancestry and cl and class cards on a on a deck and people have to pick completely at random and what you get is what you get um has has that has that been tried and could it feasibly be tried with this system it has been tried um and yes, it can feasibly be done. Um, at higher levels, it's better. Um, because you then have all your cards, and then you can like strategically place your upgrades. Mm -hmm. um, and you definitely won't get the best <laughs> combina combinations, obviously. Um, but you're not horribly weak, either. Um, it's almost like you're, uh, if you don't get to find it out, it's almost like you're, like, a level below uh, where you should be in terms of power level. Yeah. I'm not saying this would be the be the best um, get bal balanced, uh, balanced and sound idea, but it'd be, it'd be the equivalent of playing, like, ARAM in League. <laughs> it's, it's there to be yeah. chaos. Yeah. <laughs> It's a decent amount of fun um, until someone has to play like a, a role they don't really uh, want to do. I guess in the one time I tried. But if everyone was down for it, I mean, it sounds like a lot of fun chaos. Yeah. Well, uh, to that one person, all I'd have to say is the dice gods giveth and they taketh away. As we all know. <laughs> that and the That and the fact that no matter what your race, no matter what your eth no matter what your gender, no matter what what your height, weight, occupation, whatever, the dice gods hate you, and they want you to know that they hate you. They don't discriminate; they hate everyone equally. Mm -hmm. Which I personally find, um, I personally find to be a model of equality. It's what we wish. To really all be striving to be, yeah. Because hey, because hey, it could be worse. You could be dealing with uh, you could be dealing with RN Jesus in an XCOM game. Oh man, I have nightmares still. Nine percent shots missing, killing my guys. Mm -hmm. And or even worse, XCOM with the long war mod. Man, dude, I used to take breaks from that game by doing my homework. <laughs> Isn't it supposed to work the other way around? With most games, yeah. <laughs> now, yes, I do want to. I do want to offer my congrats for for the fact that at the time of this recording, you are three times over the initial goal that you had planned. Thank you. Oh, but what? But what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a hard, not a hard date per se, but just a general range. Yeah. So a general range would be around October or November. Um, a lot of that is going to be time to um, finish balancing the game. Um, Ironing out the kinks for the uh, like the manufacturing of like the deck box, got to line all the text perfectly right, and 
Um, and then just figuring out like the best like uh, shipping strategies. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's the target date, October or November period. And I I can certainly get be- I can certainly get behind that. Uh, but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And, yeah, it was great. Thank you for having me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!